A future historian, looking back over the times in which we live, will surely identify J.K. Rowling as a figure of towering importance. In a way that has few precedents since Peter Pan and Wind in the Willows, she has captured the collective imagination of the British people and filled our minds with characters and attitudes that have served as a shared frame of reference, not only in our daydreams, but in our hopes and intentions too. Through her social media presence, she has set out to turn the mind of the nation towards the soft socialism that people like her can afford. And she strives to reduce the complex world of politics to a simple battle between good and evil, of the kind that goes on forever in Hogwarts. There are those among my literary colleagues who dismiss the Harry Potter books as lowbrow literature based on cardboard characters dropped into whimsical plots that go nowhere. I don't agree with them. J.K. Rowling enjoys the kind of success that only a writer who is touched on real and universal sentiments could achieve. She has a genius for inventing characters that engage the ordinary reader's sympathies and situations in which everyday emotions are put suddenly and alarmingly to the test. Her plots may be extravagant, but there are few, if any, loose ends, and everything runs smoothly from description to dialogue and back again. She also has something of Dickens's genius when it comes to names. Dumbledore, Voldemort, Malfoy, Hagrid, Hogwarts, these and many more are now household property, like Magwitch, Peggotty and Oliver Twist. All in all, I would credit J.K. Rowling with having made a real contribution to literature, albeit literature for children. Children's literature is of two kinds. On the one hand, there are stories addressed specifically to the child's state of mind and which play with those primordial emotions that are the residue of hunter-gatherer terrors. Of this kind are the folk tales collected and embellished by the Brothers Grimm. On the other hand, there is literature that is aimed not at the child, but at the idea of the child, literature that frames the childish mind, treasures it, and also uses it to convey truths about adult reality. Among works of this second kind are some of the masterpieces of our literature, including the Alice books of Lewis Carroll and Mark Twain's story of Huckleberry Finn. Children's literature of this second kind is about the world as it really is, but written in such a way as to put the innocence and guilelessness of the child in the centre of the narrative. Children's literature of the less artful kind is not about the world as it really is, but about the world as children perceive it, when deprived of adult wisdom and experience. It is a magic world, organised by occult powers and spells. It is also a simplified world, in which good and evil are revealed in concrete terms and divide reality between them. It is a world without responsibilities, since these are all in other hands and the child who falls into such a world needs only one kind of knowledge, which is knowledge of the spells that will summon the forces of good to protect him and chase the forces of evil away. Such a world is the one described and richly furnished by J.K. Rowling, and her artful narrative will elicit the greatest praise from all who have ever tried to invent a good night story. But it raises some important questions about our culture. For although the Harry Potter books are children's stories, they have escaped from the good night moment and invaded the adult working day. The names of their characters are on everybody's lips. The internet offers Harry Potter names for dogs, cats and ponies. J.K. Rowling herself invites you to baptise your favourite or most hated politician from the resources of her lexicon, Mrs. May being clearly a Dursley, even if Corbyn has not quite reached Dumbledore status. The most interesting aspect of the Potter stories, anthropologically speaking, is that they rely on an old-fashioned and very English form of enchantment, while avoiding all reference to our traditional religious beliefs. Hogwarts is an English public school, with cloisters and uniforms, with games that instil the old sporting virtues and hierarchical discipline associated with formal dinners and ritual speeches. It is a great Gothic chapel, but with no altar and neither hymns nor prayers. So how is its enchantment maintained? The answer is by magic. And this magic is a superb creation of Rowling's, which fills every place that religion would once have occupied 
while lifting the conflict between good and evil out of the cosmic background into the foreground of human action. The conflict is revealed in forms and faces, in clefts and costumes, in the shapes and shadows of this creepy institution. Like the poet invoked by Shakespeare, Rowling has given to airy nothings a local habitation and a name. But her form of enchantment also reminds us why religion and magic have been at loggerheads. Religion tells us that we do not have power over the world and that we must learn to accept our limitations and to recognise that our salvation depends on the God who will rescue us. When we pray, we do not command the world to obey us. On the contrary, we humbly acknowledge our lack of power and ask God to intervene on our behalf. Prayer is a recognition of our weakness and a resolve at the same time to deserve God's help. In this respect, prayers are the very opposite of spells. The one who casts a spell is assuming power over reality. He has no need of God since he is God. He is assuming the powers of the Creator and subduing life and matter to his will. When alchemy was condemned by the medieval church, it was as a blasphemous attempt to usurp God's power. By moving against alchemy, the church contributed greatly to the advance of science. It forced people to renounce their desire to control the world and to try to understand it instead. Scientific experiment and theory building became the true religious obedience. I distinguished two kinds of children's literature. The kind that exploits the primordial fears and hopes of the child in which magic plays a controlling part and the kind that looks with the eyes of a child on the real adult world and brings a measure of innocence to what it sees there. Lewis Carroll, who raised this second kind of children's literature to the highest artistic level, was a mathematician with a cool, clear, scientific brain, whose heroine fights back against magic and illusion with all her delightful reasoning powers. She is the child who wants to be an adult, exploring the shadows of her own imagination and shining the light of reason that will chase those shadows away. The Harry Potter stories are the opposite of that. They show an adult world entirely invaded by childish fears and illusions. Magic and mystery are the currency in which all transactions are measured. The wand, the spell and the store of occult knowledge have displaced every kind of spiritual discipline. Each character is good or evil by nature, and there is no process of development, no path of renunciation and prayer, whereby the hero or heroine can prepare to face the ordeals of a real adult existence. All obstacles are dreams, which can be dispelled at the wave of a wand, and nobody needs any power that he cannot obtain from the things of this world, if only he knows their secrets. We expect children to think and feel in that way, because they have yet to be released from the grip of those primeval hunter-gatherer emergencies. But we also expect them to grow out of it and to address the world in full awareness of its complexity, acknowledging the patient work of science and the need for humility and understanding. Religion is one of the paths away from primitive magic, so as to face the world with a clear understanding of the fact that we do not control it. Growing up means learning that the world will not deliver the goods just because we wish for them. That adult worldview is the opposite of the mental posture shaped by Potterism. But Potterism is beginning to prevail. Rowling's hero and his circumstances have so invaded the culture that people are beginning to live in a kind of cyber Hogwarts, believing that all is within their power, since wishing for something is halfway to obtaining it. Maybe the soft socialism that is growing in the new generation of adults is partly explained by this. If you suffer from a Potter overdose, so as to see the real world too in terms of occult powers and the spells that unlock them, you are more likely to think that what you want will be provided just by clicking on a screen. J.K. Rowling's tweets to her 11 million followers encourage this attitude. They speak of a fantasy world in which goods are obtained simply by needing them and then asking some future prime minister to wave the magic wand.